the production department is majorly female uh, and oh, which is something that I'm quite proud of. The story shouldn't revolve around that, oh, there's a female in the game or there's a black man in the game and so on and so forth. You do, uh, I think uh, women and men in general, just like, like if you see it all as one group of people, they all like different kinds of things. And like, I, I don't see it as a separation. I, all my seniors speak about the recruitment and all, and gender culture does not come into play, which really brings about a sense of community throughout and through. You, you're not isolated or you're not biased against it at any point. And it brings, it brings about a good game. You get so many different opinions and cultures coming together, for sure. It's going to be amazing. That's what I can tell you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sartok. You're watching Spawn Point, and today I'm joined by Vidushi Palani from Build a Rocket Boy. She's the code project manager. Hi, Vidushi. How are you doing? Hi, Sartak. I'm good. How are you? Great, great. So can you tell us a bit about yourself, how you got into the gaming industry and everything before, <laughs> uh, before we came into this point, this juncture of time? Absolutely. Uh, well, firstly, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm an Indian, born and raised in Dubai. Uh, I've wanted to be a gamer, I think. Uh, I, I think that's since uh, my late teenage years, it, it just sort of came along with playing with my brother or seeing him playing uh, Age of Empires and so on. We just used to go crazy uh, fighting for the PC. Uh, we just had one between each other. So, uh, and I sort of wanted to uh, make this my passion, make this my career path, because it just seems, it, it, it just fits so well for, for a person like me. Um, yeah, since then, it's just been striving towards it. I made the decision of going for computer engineering uh, to have a solid base before I get into uh, a game dev company itself. That didn't work out too well for me for personal reasons. I think I'm, I just suck at giving exams. Um, so I dropped out in a couple of years and I started working uh, in different odd jobs just to, you know, uh, sort of get experience in working with companies while I would study at was home. There, uh, uh, were those odd jobs related to computers or just odd jobs in general? No, odd jobs in general, actually. I started with uh, being a receptionist at a real estate company. Uh, whatever jobs you could get without a degree, actually. Uh, slowly and steadily, I sort of built my experience, built my uh, resume enough to be project coordinator in a web design company. So that was my first uh, entrance into getting um, getting into something in, into, uh, with, with computers itself. Mm -hmm. um, slowly and steadily, as I built my... Uh, you know, portfolio, my understanding of the industry. Of course, you have to understand, I had come back to Dubai and game dev was still in its infancy around 2012 to 2014. Uh, there was just, there was just Ubisoft that, that I know of in Abu Dhabi. Uh, but like, because like there weren't many uh, game dev uh, developing companies, there was a gamer community for sure, mm -hmm. but not enough game dev uh, companies. So it was tough for me to crack it over there itself. Uh, finally, when companies did, did start picking up, I got an internship uh, in a game dev studio in, in Dubai and built myself up from there as a game developer intern to a full time to a year later as in project management. And then in three years time, I'm here now <laughs> after COVID. So it just took off from there. Yeah, after that, I think once someone shows their faith in you and once you sort of have experience and get into the industry, it becomes it becomes relatively, I can't say easy, but it just becomes, uh, your path is a little bit more clearer. Uh, it was uh, like, I've been very fortunate with my opportunities, no matter like, you know, the tough decisions and everything. Uh, right now I'm in Edinburgh in Scotland, uh, which is life-changing because in Dubai, I used to work for arcade games and now I'm working for a AAA game. So, which is pretty cool. Um, so before I dive into all the heavy questions, you mentioned Age of Empires, you played that, you played Age of Empires for growing up. Was that your favorite game? Yeah, it was definitely one of one of my favorites for sure. Uh, it's, I mean, like it went from Age of Empires, Max Payne to, you know, various different uh, uh, shooter games as well. But Age of Empires did stick around to be one of my favorites. So do you still play, uh, play with the latest Age of Empires? I once booted up Age of Empires when I got Xbox Game Pass 
and I simply couldn't wrap my head around everything that was going on. Yeah, it's become quite quite complex, right? Uh, no, unfortunately, not as much. Uh, there used to be like there was after going to uh, or rather when when like you know when I was trying to work my way upwards and sort of build my portfolio, uh, it was all about game dev rather than actually getting like you know having like a chunk of time just for gaming that I would do in school and stuff. So uh, eventually it became what I was working on and I would only play games for those genres. So when in my previous company where I was working on arcades, uh, it was, you know, casual, hyper casual games uh, that I would focus on. And of course the company pivoted towards going into educational games. So it was more on uh, that, but since, started, since I started working, uh, you know, it's just in game nights, like, you know, for a couple of nights that when we, we used to be able to get together with friends and everything that, you know, we actually got around to playing World of Warcraft and all of that. So it, it's still something pretty close to my heart, but it's not something that I give as much time as I could. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now we jump into the actually heavy questions. Um, sure. So you went to school for programming, for computer science, but from where I come from and where even with my friends, who are living abroad in the Western countries, programming has been perceived something as a male dominant sector. Maybe it's because of lack of female participants or representation, I'm not really sure. So what do you think is the reason behind that? And do you think that uh, the females who are there, e even though in small numbers suffer from that? Personally, I haven't felt, uh, I haven't, I haven't faced that sort of discrimination or, you know, identification of programming as uh, something owned by men or something that is only, or is better done by men. Mm -hmm. In fact, all around me, I've always faced, a, I've, I've had, uh, I mean, even in India, being in an engineering college, the numbers do speak that like, and there are just more men than female, at least when I was there in 2010 to 2012. Uh, but the numbers are still increasing. You still see more women coming into, you know, the mainstream programming, mainstream, uh, mainstream technical roles. Um, so that just, it, it is a changing dynamic. It may have been something that uh, used to be somewhat uh, uh, like a stigma that this is supposed to be done by men and like women were, uh, you know, uh, maybe... I mean, definitely, they've, they've definitely had some sort of bias against them, but I have not faced it personally. And I have, they're, they're my friends to my colleagues, they've only and only been encouraging and supportive. So, yeah, for me, I think there is a change that is happening right now. Um, so just as you mentioned this change, a few hours ago, I was reading that the ownership of PlayStation consoles has gone up from about 13% female all the way up to 48%, which is almost equal. So do you yeah. think as a game developer or you have extensive background in game devs? So do you think developers are changing their perception to making games to make them more friendly to the female audience or at least add representation for the female audience? Well, here's the thing. Uh, you know, you while the stories don't necessarily, like you don't need to have a female oriented story in a game uh like within the content for it to appeal to women women all around whether that's actually men women people of different cultural backgrounds each sector if you see have so many varying uh interests so you know there'll be people who like rpgs there'll be people who like uh open world i mean like there's so so many genres that so many kinds of people are like you know through and through so if i say that if i make um there's a sense of normalization that you want, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that having female characters uh, within a game, it, like, you know, shows a representation, but it shouldn't, the story shouldn't revolve around that, oh, there is a female in the game or there's a black man in the game and so on and so forth. You do, uh, I think uh, women and men in general, just like, like if you see it all as one group of people, they all like different kinds of things. And like, I, I don't see it as a separation. I just see that, um, I think the major shift that I have seen is that women themselves don't think uh, gaming is uh, a male sport. It isn't, it is something that they can enjoy as well. And they are now exposed to enjoying. Previously, you wouldn't buy an Xbox. You wouldn't think of buying an Xbox for a girl as a gift. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but now it's something that you know that they can experiment with and possibly enjoy. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so can you tell me about how diverse is your workplace at your current job and at your previous positions? Uh, diversity in culture or in gender? Um, both. Why not both? <laughs> uh, okay. So culturally, yes, it's quite, it's quite diverse. Uh, there is in, in, within the team that I'm working in, there's just one person from Scotland and the rest are from all over the world. Uh, it's, and it, it really brings together, especially like off topic chats and off project chats are just so in, like, you just learn so much and you, you get together with so many different cultures coming together, comparing it. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, in terms of gender, uh, Within the production department, the production department is majorly female, uh, and which is something that I'm quite proud of. Uh, the like the other departments are all varied. I mean, like it's not necessarily like in my particular team, I'm the only girl, but that's not true for all of the departments. It's just so that it happens uh, that I'm the only girl. But I know for a fact that recruitment is not looked at, you know, from gender perspective. They they are quite open to, because I, like all my seniors speak about the recruitment and all and gender culture does not come into play um, at all. So, which which really brings about a sense of community throughout and through, you, you're not isolated or you're not biased against it at any point. And it brings, it brings about a good game. You get so many different opinions and cultures coming together for sure. Oh, following up on the different opinions, I've had the chance to talk to animators, production heads and stuff, all the, uh, different sorts of people in the gaming industry business. This is the first time I'm speaking to someone who's related to coding. Do you think uh, having different opinions from different cultural and gender backgrounds brings about a better product? Or can you give me your perspective specifically to coding? Because I don't really know much about it. I think it's just technical. But then again, I'd like a professional's opinion. Um. Actually, tell me this. Let me let me phrase this as, as a question. Like, if you <laughs> pick up only one sector, right? If you say, um, like, the most prominent, uh, uh, what we are used to is seeing that white male own the game dev industry, mm-hmm. right? So let's pick up a group of white male uh, in the coding department. You would still expect different opinions <laughs> from each one of them. So I don't see it. I, I mean, I, I see that coming from different cultures, coming from different backgrounds, uh, uh, like that all adds to the cultural value of the, uh, uh, of the game itself. It does bring in different opinions, but I expect that because our, our age is such that, you know, we see as all as one. It's not like different, you know, we don't see the difference. We just enjoy the, you know, we enjoy the difference rather, uh, I should say. So it, it just brings about, uh, it, as long as you have, like-minded people with the same objective, all those different opinions will always come. We do need leadership in terms of like, you know, this is the objective, this is what we want to achieve. We're not like, unless the company is, a company decides to pivot, you know, then that's when you pivot, but that's a whole different thing. The company is going towards in one, in one direction, their, you know, the content direction is set and we're all going to achieve the same goal. So yeah, we expect those different opinions to come anyway. So those opinions are coming from people who identify themselves as gamers rather than with their cultural or gender identity. Yes, it's just all one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So have you faced any challenges in the industry, maybe specific to your gender or maybe at large? No, not within the industry. I think the only one is that the one I mentioned, it's just getting into it. But that was mainly, again for my personal case, it was uh, of where I was and mm-hmm. that uh, the game dev community was, it, you know, it's still up and coming and there's a lot of activity going on in Dubai right now about it. Uh, and at the time that I was applying, it was tough for me to get in uh, or get the exposure that I needed. So that was the only challenge, but like I said, perseverance, <laughs> just keep applying. <laughs> okay. So well, this que- uh, the next question is a bit different from diversity aspect. You see, game development studios are basically consolidated in a few countries. You got Americas, the North Americas, a bit of UK, a bit of Western Europe, and Japan, and a bit of China. Yeah. And a lot of 
countries are left out as such a lot of opinions are left out do you think bringing about uh building new studios in those countries maybe the whole bread studios who come out from the crown or maybe who come up from the support of other studios can make the gaming uh, make video games a more diverse space you know ha- having more diverse opinions for example i'll tell you this one of the games that i'm really looking forward to is called black myth wukong it's from a chinese developer and it has a very chinese story it's based on journey to the west with the chinese fable and i'm really looking forward to that because i've never had uh, never played uh, an authentic chinese story and i get to play that because it's a homebred studio yeah um well like you said i mean the solution is right there right like bringing in more com- uh, more more talent from uh you know all over so it appeals to it now you want to play something that's authentic to china um so that works well with the company is from there and you know their content writers are from there who know the um you know the background or or, or like you know the mannerisms of the people over there but if you're looking for something that's globally accepted then you want to look at uh, like you know bringing different cultures together uh, about those hubs i think uh, yeah absolutely i mean in india itself you have bangalore as bangalore and pune called the it hubs um, you know it's spreading now to noida and my knowledge may be limited but you i mean like you, know, you have these hubs coming up everywhere of different like of different niches so you want uh, definitely i mean globalization is a way to go and many companies that i know of uh, in uk have branches in india and um uh, like there there's there are quite a few actually and that's that that's what like you know really brings about uh, brings it about together you have so um you know different uh, different local talent coming together so it, it it is growth that is already in place it's already happening and <laughs> definitely india's uh, number one spot for tech i guess okay and um, so from our conversation i've gathered that the opinions of gamers are put forward before opinions as a ethnic class or gender right so do you think it's even essential to have a diverse team to make a better product or is it just essential to have a better team in sense of better talent not a more diverse team I don't think you can take one from the other it's um I mean you're always looking for best style uh, talent you don't want to have some forced representation you want to uh, make sure that the people at the end like game dev companies or businesses they have to mm-hmm. make sure that the operations run or uh you know the quality of the work being delivered is up to par so it's uh you're definitely looking for talent but if you say that uh you know you're going to look at one sector or group of people and you're not looking for diversity uh then are you saying that you want to shut the doors to uh like you know to the rest of the world or the rest of the cultures um like let's take about the recruitment after or since the pandemic began mm-hmm. because of remote working the borders have opened right people want to work remote people have more so uh companies can now hire from all over the world and they know that those people are comfortable with remote working so relocation is not an issue and so on and so forth so more people from different cultural backgrounds are being hired because now they are logistically available so um i i like i don't think you can see one without the other you're going to if you want a more talented team you're going to have to open the borders to sorry open your doors to more than just what what is near you or what is what you know of it has to be something beyond that this is the first positive impact of the pandemic that i've heard of <laughs> in the gaming sector i'm really i'm really great to hear that okay yeah. so as you've told me that you have been playing games for a rather long time if you could direct a game from start to finish without any creative or financial restrictions what would that game look like Oh, that's a tricky question. Um <laughs> the thing is that if I've been in the mode of playing a game and just like amazed at that or enjoying the game itself or I've been in the state of 
working towards you know one particular game or uh, you know different games for the companies that I'm working for so I haven't particularly given a thought to what I would do if I were doing this by myself mainly because I'm scared of running a business um <laughs> but that's, <a> <laughs> well, that's why I said no financial restrictions <laughs> Yeah, but that's not the only thing. You have to worry about the other aspects of running the game, um, the operational aspects and so on. Um, no, I think there was uh, a mix of guitar pro and uh, karaoke uh, was something that I was trying to develop in my previous game, mainly because my father loves singing and uh, he loves having an audience in the crowd. Uh, uh, but obviously that's not, that's not an everyday thing. I mean, you can definitely call people and have a karaoke party, but still. So uh, given that I, I used to work uh, with on VR arcade games a lot previously. So this was one of the idea that, you know, we had different kinds of audiences, whether you're in a hall concert and, uh, or like different scenarios that you can choose from, have songs that you can select and just sing in front of an audience. Uh, maybe even have it like an Indian Idol or American Idol style where, you know, you have uh, judges score you based on your pitch and so on and so forth. So that was one of the games that I had started working on. But again, for an arcade, it didn't particularly make sense. <laughs> okay, so I'm heading to the end of my questions here. Can you tell me a bit about Build a Rocket? I've also had the chance to talk to another animator from the company but he couldn't yeah. tell me anything because mostly it's under <laughs> NDA I know you cannot even speak stuff that's under NDA but what can you tell me about Build a Rocket by over the NDA part it's going to be amazing that's what I can tell you <laughs> and when is it going to come out can you give me like a decade long time frame is it going to be <laughs> this decade or the next one no I can't do that unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> Damn it's, it. it's a it, it's it's worth the wait that's 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 the uh, like just a bit I think I was I've just joined Builder Rocket Boy last September and it's been uh, one of the most uh, amazing journeys through the story and through learning everything that's going on uh, it's built by a bunch of gamers who uh, are passionate about the game, who are ambitious about the game. Uh, we have an amazing leadership. Um, so yeah, look forward to it. Definitely. It'll be worth the wait. I don't know how forward I'm looking to it. Is it like <laughs> five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line? But all right, if you say, I'll just wait. Two people have so far I told me from the company to wait for it. So I guess we have to wait. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I can say. <laughs> Trust me, it's hard for us as well. <laughs> yeah, I guess you cannot even, uh, when you come to talk to your friends or people from media like me, and you're working on something that you're so passionate and ambitious about, and you have to hold your tongue that you cannot reveal any of the details. Yeah, trust me, that's that's what, like, that's the biggest problem. But we are, we are really hoping that, uh, uh, I, I think one of the, questions that is asked most often to the leadership amongst others is uh, when would like you know when, when can we start talking about it uh, so we don't even know when can we start talking about it or when will some PR be released but that is I mean of course the management does know they have a timeline but it's like uh, it, it's worth keeping it a secret as well as and it will it will be worth the wait. At least, for like, our, our only consolation is that I can play the game every day, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's not as polished as uh, the game that I'll be playing. Yes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so whenever the PR on the NDA and the embargoes are lifted, please have a talk with me again. I really want to know what's going on in this new AAA studio. Absolutely. Okay, so for the final question, can you tell me what's the one career advice that you'd like to give to the youth and how important is formal education in the game dev sector? Hmm. Uh, for the youth, I think uh, one of the main things is uh, work on your own projects, whichever field uh, you're going into. So if you're going into a technical or aesthetic side, right? You're going into the technical coding side, make your own projects, uh, start looking at 
you know, contribute to the various forums, vote for Game Jams, and the same thing for the artistic side, whether that's art, animators, technical artists, and so on. Uh, keep up with, you know, trying to, uh, uh, you know, try, try to keep up with your own projects uh, and make sure that's at the front of your, you know, resume, because that's what matters. Um, in terms of formal education for game dev specifically, not having done it i'm not entirely sure what the coursework looks like but um the engine itself changes uh every few months so keep up with what's going on in the uh you know with the various engines whether that's unreal unity and the various others that are in the market right now um and uh, because they all have a very steep learning curve and they all have their own um uh you know their own quality and, and so on so you uh like get get ahead of the game knowing the engine is definitely a perk uh whether that's even photoshop for the artist the uh and like you know all the others for your separate own sectors so the information is available many courses are available online if you need extra help um yeah that's that's for the youth in terms of uh, sorry what was the second part of the question well these are the two parts of, uh, the formal education part but you answered that as well yeah, formal education. Yeah, that's uh, it, it is important in terms of uh, getting some expert opinions. Like, of course, you're making a portfolio, you're doing all of this, but you want someone's opinion on the quality of the work that you're doing. That's where it counts for sure. Okay, so those were all the questions from my side. Any closing comments, Vidushi? No, just thank you for having <laughs> me once again. And this was brilliant. Look forward to the next one. Yeah, but. By the next one, I'm hoping that <laughs> Builder Rocket Boy will tell me something about their game. So, you know, yeah. you know, since no none of the details are out, I don't really know much about the game. Right. It's and I was, called every. <laughs> That's right. what I can tell you. But I wasn't really excited about it. But then I had the chance to talk to the people who are working on it. And now they're, both of them have hyped me up. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I blame you guys. Now you have to send me a PR copy of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. We'll do for sure. I think, uh, I, I hope hopefully uh, whenever it's out, then we can talk again, uh, talk a little bit more about it. Maybe some more uh, experienced people can, uh, some more senior yeah, people finally can stuff in. that you want to say and you will be able to say it that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, then. That was Vidushi Balani on Spawn Point. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.